All right, so today's going to be a little bit interesting. I'm going to be doing an analysis of um, a certain inscription from the Georgia Guidestones. Now, if you don't know what the Georgia Guidestones are, these were um, recently destroyed, but they were a series of um, 12 inscriptions, uh, eight major inscriptions and four minor inscriptions in just as many languages that were placed on these stones um, in Elberton, Georgia. The stones were arranged in such a way that they make use of solar phenomena. And so, you know, maybe it's an homage to Stonehenge or, you know, earlier monolithic monuments around the world, as well as inscriptions. And in fact, I had read by the same person who had commissioned the stones that they intend to be a to have a Rosetta Stone quality about them in all those languages. And one thing I'll say that's really interesting is in, in my field, um, we, you know, we deal with text and artifact, right? And, you know, the, the text as ancient artifact as well. And so sometimes we encounter um, inscriptions, you know, in languages we don't know. And there's a couple out there that still haven't been cracked. Um, but sometimes we're able to hack the languages. We're able to decode the languages because we find comparable literature or direct translations like the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone had three three languages, basically. It had uh, ancient Greek, it had Demotic, which is a, a, a late form of ancient Egyptian, and then it had hieroglyphic um, Egyptian on it. And so we're able to decode the hieroglyphs because we knew Greek. And same with Demotic. You know, we're able to decode Demotic because we had Greek sort of as the key. So now let's go ahead and we'll look at the stones and I'll walk you through the Akkadian of the stones. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it need work? Who did it? Those are all questions I think um, we may be able to ask after looking at this. So these are what the Georgia Guidestones looked like before they were recently destroyed. You can tell there are four um, standing stones as wings, a central post with a hole in it for, um, I believe it's measuring the, the solstices. On top is the headstone, and um, each of these has an inscription. Of course, the large standing stones, um, these stelae, if you will, and you will, um, contain basically the same inscription. One of them is in English, so it's easy to understand. The top inscription is much shorter, actually. Uh, it's basically a, one sentence, and um, it's represented in four different ancient languages, and the languages are Sanskrit, Greek, ancient Egyptian and Babylonian cuneiform, as it's called um, in the Guidestone monuments themselves. Now, uh, we would just call it Akkadian, um, but it is written with cuneiform. And this is fun. For those of you who are listening who've never seen or heard about Akkadian before, you can watch some of my other videos talking about the language. It's basically the language of ancient Mesopotamia, of the Babylonian and Assyrian civilizations or empires. And it's um, one of the more influential languages of the ancient world, which is why it was picked. Here's what the inscription looks like. Um, one thing that we can say right off the right off the bat is that the inscription is made from a textbook. In other words, um, ancient inscriptions don't look like this. This is clearly taken from a textbook because this is how we write Akkadian with a pencil or a pen. Now, mind you, Akkadian is written by taking a wedge, a cuneos, that's why we call it cuneiform, and impressing that wedge. Think of it, think of it like a nail, sort of, right? You press that into clay and you make a mark, and that mark tends to look triangular, right? And so um, it's through those series of marks that the whole cuneiform writing system developed. However, looking here, we see that these are represented textbook style, the way that scholars or anyone who's trying to write cuneiform with a pen or pencil would do. We draw a little triangle, and then we'd have a line from one end of the triangle sort of to indicate the impression that was put into clay. And let me just take this same inscription and do it a different way. So if you look in the center, the center is the inscription as it would look if it were impressed in clay. The images on the top and bottom, however, these are from a monument, the um, Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser. I took these sections just to show you the imagery and how certain signs would be written. Um, the mesh, this is the plural marker. Um, we can also see a, a symbol for the sound ud or day. 
Uh, this is another marker. Could mean a person's name. Could be one. Could be um, a a preposition. Um, could be a ditto mark. It has a number of values and meanings. This is uh, sha sha two actually. And finally, this is u or u two. So it makes the sound u. And you can tell just by looking at these. You know, um, this is what it's supposed to look like. I started to translate it. Um, it got a little awkward. Um, and, you know, I happen to have seen the Greek. So there's another one that's another inscription of the same smaller inscription in Greek. And um, that, and you know, that, that kind of um, sped up the process because the Greek's pretty easy. So, you know, that is like how the Rosetta Stone works, right? It, you get a clue. Um, and then from that clue, you're able to decode. Um, the Greek is Pretty straightforward. Um, behold the the stones, the way guiding the way to eternal wisdom, something like that. Okay, so that's that was my Rosetta Stone moment. And the Rosetta Stone, you know, we um, we have these three languages, you know, Greek, Demotic, and hieroglyphic, um, ancient Egyptian in hieroglyphic, that is, and we use the Greek basically as our key to decode it. So we could do the same with the Akkadian, um, at least to give us a hint, because it doesn't pop out entirely the same. But look, this is these are made by different translators, according to the brochure on the Guidestones. Um, and so some of them, someone had to have some knowledge of cuneiform to put this together. I have some ideas you know, about um, how the process went about, because there's X amount of people in the world who've studied this language. Um, and then there's you know, even fewer, there's Y amount who've studied it for any considerable period of time. Usually what happens is uh, people who study it, the vast majority of them, they'll do a year or so, um, may, maybe in a seminary context, maybe in a university research context, and they will then use it sort of to help them research something else, whether it's the Bible or um, archaeology, ancient history, something to be able to say that they they know the principles of a text if they need to verify something that a specialist, um, an Assyriologist or a Sumerologist has put together. Uh, and so, you know, the the Z, the others who've studied this language are the specialists, the ones who spend their lives dedicated to it. I'm somewhere between Y and Z. I'm not a I'm not a master or a specialist, but I've somehow find a way to um, actually somewhat provide a, li a living teaching the language. So, you know, I have a long way to go myself, but I do have a love and passion for it. And if you ever want to study it, let me know and I can direct you to a college university. Um, you can study with me or you could uh, learn on your own. There's a number of resources out there that are available. Um, and that's fantastic because in the past we didn't have those. Back to the inscription itself. Here's what it looks like in that in that font that represents us trying to write it with a pen or pencil. The other thing I want to mention here is that the font that they chose is a specific style. We might call it Neo-Assyrian. It's not the earliest style. If you look at the Code of Hammurabi, for example, that's going to look more like Sumerian. That's going to be the old Babylonian um, type of cuneiform. These are evolved signs. Uh, they're considerably different in some ways and very similar in others. Um, you know, just the, like the bottom line has some things that look the same um, and others that look quite different. Uh, the second to last character on the right, for example, looks pretty different. In the middle line, uh, the first character on the left, which is like two dashes on the left and one going down, um, that was that looked more like a star, you know, originally. So this is a developed version of it. Well, what does it say? You should know that each one of these signs represents some kind of value. Most of the time for Akkadian, it's going to be a phonetic value, a syllable. Uh, sometimes it could represent a logogram. A logogram is just a sign that is written uh, that, you know, stands for meaning something else. Okay. So here we have uh, basically, you know, na for mesh, um, the last two, and then there's this ru at the end behind it. Na for mesh means stones or stele, naru. Um, and then we have what would be ru three, a phonetic complement. I'll come back to that. But uh, the logograms basically indicate, okay, if you see this thing, it should remind you of 
the the word that it means. We do this all the time nowadays when we text people things, right? We'll we'll pick a symbol or a sign. We'll say, I heart you, right? And that heart is the, you know, it's the shape of a heart. Um, the only words we use, or yeah, the only words are I and Y-O-U, right? And in between is this picture of a heart. And we know to read that as I love you, right? So that heart in your your texting, your emojis or whatever, that's a logogram, okay? So as we read this, um, we get these values coming out. This is what I got from, from it. When I looked at it, I said, okay, it's probably this stuff. Um, some of it's easy. Some of it's, you know, um, things that maybe I haven't seen spelled this way before. Uh, the last word, chasesi, um, I haven't seen spelled uh, that way. And maybe I don't need to, to make shesh. The, that's what the character is, shesh. Um, it typically means brother or something, but it also has the value, the, the sound, the phonological value of cease. And that's how I took it afterwards. I took it to be normalized in a certain way. So just if you don't know much about Akkadian, the way I've written it here is how I'm reading the value of every sign. And then from that, I'm able to construct the actual words. I did it in such a way that it reads Lisbat su naru anutu kiredu gini ume shahasisi. There's some interesting things about this. Um, first off, the first verb, um, let him take or let one take, right? That's that's going to be something um, interesting for comparison with the other translations. We saw the Greek earlier. Then we have a su naru su is like a durable stone. So think of an anvil or something, something strong. And so a naru is our word for stila or a standing stone, like a monumental stone. And so uh, the two combined, I, I've only really seen naru su, um, you know, or nara sa or something like that. So it's interesting that um, su here is first. And I, I don't know if there's other inscriptions out there or, or texts where that's the case. Um, anutu, these, um, that redu, or guiding, gini ume, shakasisi, toward perpetual days, or like etern or eternity, something like that. Perpetual days of wisdom. Perpetual days of wisdom. Lispat sunaru anutu ki redu, gini ume, shakasisi. Chasisi is an interesting term at the end uh, for wisdom, something like that. Might mean something different, uh, like... I don't know, understanding, something like that. But it has to do with the aperture of the ear, so the hole in the ear. And uh, if one who listens well, right, who's a good listener, um, attentive maybe, uh, perceptive, that's sort of the sense that is probably common to both Akkadian and English. So that idea of being able to listen and figure out things is where the wisdom idea comes from. Now, cognate-wise, in Arabic, it means something like a villainous or, you know, um, aberrant, you know, scoundrelly, something like that. Um, it's not a, a flattering thing. It, it's kind of, you know, the people who uh, work in the shadows uh, type of wisdom, if you want to call it that crafty, like the, the, the craftiness of a villain is kind of how you might want to think of it. Um, and there's other words for wisdom too. So it's interesting that this was chosen. I don't think that that was intentional, but who knows? It, it all depends on who's translating it and what the real intent is. I think they're just trying to capture the idea, you know, that later I found out actually, um, as I was going through and, you know, doing some more reading on the Guidestones, I saw, you know, the brochure handbook and from it, there's um, the explanation of what it should be. So um, my reading comes out something like, let him take these monolithic stelae for guiding to everlasting wisdom, something of like that. Now, if you compare that with what they intend, let these be guidestones to an age of reason. You know, you could see how, like, it's basically the same thing, to everlasting wisdom, to you know, perpetual days of wisdom, something like that. I mean, it's, it's effectively the same meaning. Uh, so don't get hung up on, you know, where they are different. Little differences don't matter too much in translation if the same sense is being conveyed. And that's really the key. Translators want to convey the sense. It's very rare that you get one-to-one -one correspondence between languages with every term. And that's not just the case uh, for languages, but languages in time, even within the same language, you know, um, words sort of change in terms of their nuance and, um, you know, maybe the context of the culture.
So think about these things however you will. Um, I think the languages are fun, and I like the fact that we have something like a, you know, I, I love uh, multilingual inscriptions. They are fantastic. And um, it, it's what I do in my own research. So having something or having had something uh, in the United States was great. Now, it's also the case that some of these inscriptions are sometimes destroyed. And so we have to pick up the pieces and research from there. Who knows what someone will find in the future um, or how they'll be preserved or, you know, if they'll be ground to nothing or, you know, whatever's going to happen. So that's it for the Georgia Guidestones and their translation. Um, I'd love it if you leave me a comment. Um, feel free to like, share this video. And if any of these videos are helpful or interesting to you, go ahead and subscribe. I have a lot of quirky, fun things in addition to nerdy things coming up. Mm -hmm.